So now we're going to be reviewing reversible inhibitors. And so here I have a line weaver Burke plot or a double reciprocal plot of a typical enzymatic reaction. And so this line represents a particular reaction that is uninhibited. Now let's say we add an inhibitor and it changes the plot to look like this instead. Well, this is an example of what a competitive inhibitor would look like. Now let's say we add yet another type of inhibitor and it changes the graph to look like this. Just by looking at the graph, we can tell that this is a non-competitive inhibitor. All right, so now let's talk about what exactly an inhibitor is. So say we have an enzyme, and I'll draw a little enzyme protein over here and label it E. And we have the active site of the enzyme uh, in this little groove up here, and then I'll draw the substrate in red and we'll put S for substrate. An inhibitor is basically a molecule that either decreases the rate at which this enzymatic reaction occurs or it stops the enzyme activity completely. And so if this molecule prevents binding of the substrate, either by physically blocking it from binding at the active site or by binding at a separate site called an allosteric site, and somehow prevents the binding of the substrate in this way, then it's called a competitive inhibitor. Now, if an inhibitor has the ability to bind to the enzyme, even if the substrate is already attached, and it's able to either reduce or stop the enzymatic reaction that way, then we would call this a non-competitive inhibitor. And non-competitive inhibitors are almost always going to be binding at an allosteric site, which is a site separate from where the active site of the enzyme is. Whereas with competitive inhibitors, they may either bind to the active site or an allosteric site. So now let's do sort of a direct head-to-head -head, uh, comparison between competitive and non-competitive inhibitors. And we'll start with whether the inhibitor resembles the substrate. And the answer for competitive inhibitors is yes. And that's what gives them the qualities of being able to bind to the same active site that the substrate does. Whereas non-competitive inhibitors, the answer is no, they don't resemble the substrate because they tend to bind to its own allosteric site and influence enzymatic reaction uh, that way. Another key concept to think about is whether or not this inhibitor is able to be overcome by an increase in substrate. And the answer is that yes, for competitive inhibitors, they are able to be overcome by an increase in the substrate concentration. And so if you just picture the substrate concentration increasing all around these enzymes here, then the likelihood that one of these substrate molecules takes a place in the active site versus the competitive inhibitor in the active site increases. And so at a certain point, an increase in substrate concentration will overcome the uh, effects of the competitive inhibitor. Whereas for a non-competitive inhibitor, the answer is no. They are not overcome by an increase in substrate concentration because they can bind to the enzyme and and exert their inhibitory effects even when the substrate is already bound. So it doesn't matter if the enzymes are maximally bound by an increase in substrate concentration. The next key takeaway point is recognizing whether or not the inhibitor binds to the active site. For competitive inhibitors, the answer is yes and no. They can either bind to the active site or bind to an allosteric site. But if you're asking whether or not they have the ability to bind to the active site, then the answer is yes. Whereas we know for non-competitive inhibitors, the answer is no, they bind to an allosteric site. Next, let's look at the effect on Vmax. And this is where the line weaver burke plot really comes in handy. If we look at Vmax for a competitive inhibitor, we have to look at the y-intercept, because remember the y-intercept is one over Vmax. And for competitive inhibitors, the y-intercept doesn't change. So we know that Vmax stays the same. So the effect on Vmax is None. Whereas for a non-competitive inhibitor, we see that the y-intercept has increased. And for the y-intercept to increase, this means that Vmax has to decrease because it's a reciprocal. So the effect on Vmax is decreased for a non-competitive inhibitor. Now let's look at the effect on Km. And to do this, we instead look at the x-intercept. 
and it helps to recall that the x-intercept represents 1 over negative km. So looking at the competitive inhibitor first, we see that the x-intercept has shifted to the right. So this means that the km must have increased because it's a negative reciprocal. Whereas for a non-competitive inhibitor, we see that the x-intercept is the same. So the effect on km is that it is unchanged. And finally, what does this all sort of mean in the big picture of pharmacodynamics? Well, it means that for competitive inhibitors, because they increase the substrate concentration needed to reach one half of the maximum velocity, so they increase Km, but they overall don't have an effect on the maximum velocity of the reaction and can be overcome by an increase in substrate, all it means is that competitive inhibitors decrease the potency of an enzymatic reaction. And then for non-competitive inhibitors, we know that they don't change the Km, but they do decrease the maximum velocity of an enzyme. And increasing the concentration of the substrate has no change on the non-competitive inhibitor's effects on the, on the enzymatic reaction. And so this means that there's an overall decrease in efficacy. And so these are kind of the key takeaway points for comparing the differences between competitive and non-competitive inhibitors.